Have you taken a cruise since cruising recommenced? Or are you somebody that used to love cruising, but at the time where flights are being cancelled left, right and centre, and with cruise lines chopping and changing their rules and requirements, you don't feel comfortable getting back on board and doing what you love? In this video, I'm going to compare our experiences on nine different cruise ships with five different cruise lines since cruising recommenced in summer 2021. And I'm going to ask the question, is cruising as good as it used to be? I'm not going to sugarcoat this. The answer is a big fat no. Cruise lines are having to endure a complex balancing act between making sure they're earning revenue by taking as many passengers as possible and making sure that they keep the big C under control. It's not an easy task. You have passengers that want to experience cruising in the same ways that they used to, at the standards we've all come to love, but at the same time, the cruise lines need protocols and measures in place to maintain a safe environment on board. It's so easy in the heat of a moment to blurt out, just get rid of all the rules, we need to live with this. I've said something close to that, have you? Well, it's not that simple when it comes to cruising. Have you ever been on a cruise and seen this yellow flag flying at the mast? Well, that flag has meaning. Its full meaning is my vessel is healthy and I request free critique. In modern day language, that means that my vessel is healthy and I request clearance. If a ship cannot give assurance to a port authority that they're not harboring an infectious disease on board, then it's likely that required clearance will be denied and your dream cruise could slowly become a nightmare. While we understand the importance of having certain rules and protocols in place to minimise any outbreaks and ensure cruises go ahead as planned, passenger patience is severely tested when there are rules in place that defy logic and degrade a passenger's cruising experience. To give you an idea of a nonsensical protocol we experienced on Anthem of the Seas, all of the books were removed from the library to minimise contact, yet you could still drive bumper cars, gamble in the casino, and you could take a dip with 50 fellow passengers. Now, that particular policy has most likely been abandoned, but if case numbers rise again, then there's a good chance we'll see various cruise lines reintroduce measures such as these. Let's face it, cruise lines are up to their shoulders in debt. Carnival Corporation posted net losses of more than $8 billion in 2021 and has failed to meet financial targets in the first and second quarters of 2022. Cruise lines had a choice. They could hike their cruise fares in the hope of generating more revenue and increasing their margins, or they could cut expenditure. And by that, I mean your onboard experience. They went for cuts. There's no doubt about it. Cruise fares haven't really increased in price, in fact there's some really great deals to be had if you search hard enough and if you're flexible with your dates, but the cuts on board are pretty noticeable. The biggest example of cuts is to crewing. Crews have been reduced on most cruise lines and to add salt to the wound, companies such as P&O have policies in place where crew must self-isolate for a certain period of time if they test positive for the big C. This was made known to us by the head waiter at Sindhu on Britannia. We tried to book a table and we were told that the restaurant was fully booked, despite there being numerous amounts of vacant tables. Upon making this point to the head waiter, he responded by saying, we don't have enough chefs and waiters. This was also the case at all other speciality dining venues on board Britannia, and it was a similar case on Queen Elizabeth and Iona too. Self-isolation policies for crew is not sustainable and it's not fair that passengers aren't able to book restaurants and other facilities that are clearly advertised to them when making a cruise booking. But at the same time, it's not fair for crew to infect fellow crew members and passengers when they know they've tested positive. It's another complex issue and I don't know the solution and it's clear that cruise lines certainly don't. We're still living through extraordinary times but just be prepared for you to struggle booking certain activities and venues because of a lack of crew. And don't be surprised if the service you've come to love about cruising a few years ago isn't quite as good now. 
Cuts are also pretty obvious in other areas, particularly when it comes to main dining. Since cruising recommenced, there has been a significant decline in the standards of food on board. Every ship except Britannia, Iona and Ambience, there were issues for us. There is no doubt in our minds that cruise lines are serving inferior and cheaper produce in their dining rooms to cut costs. And it's also obvious that portion sizes have been reduced and menus have been cut vastly to the point that there were only four starters and mains with Cunard and only one choice if you were a vegetarian. If you didn't want a stuffed aubergine, then you were stuffed. These changes benefit the cruise lines in a multitude of different ways. Firstly, they're paying less for inferior quality produce. They're also making efficiency savings by slimming down their menus and cutting portion sizes. And on top of that, they know that people like us will be prepared to put our hands in our pocket and go to a speciality dining venue to eat better quality cuisine. It's a win-win for the cruise lines, but it's a shame that it's so obvious. Putting it bluntly, some of the food we've eaten on cruise ships in recent months hasn't been much better than a school dinner. However, the standard and quality of food served in the buffet-style restaurants on cruise ships doesn't seem to have deteriorated. Variety seems to be about the same as it was before, and the quality of food, particularly on Cunard and Royal Caribbean, has been very good indeed. Speciality restaurants are a little more expensive than they were before the pause in cruise operations, and some cruise lines have done it in a sneaky way. One example is on Britannia. The Indian restaurant Sindhu used to incur an £18 per person cover charge, and you used to get complimentary dishes from the chef and palate cleansers etc. But now they charge you per dish. Sounds fair right? Well, not really. They've got rid of the complimentary dishes from the chef and the palate cleansers, which degrades the overall dining experience. And if you have a three course meal like you got with the original cover charge, it now works out at around £48 per couple, which is a £12 increase in the price. It's not just dining that's more expensive, you can also expect prices to be elevated for spas and other amenities, shops, shore excursions and drink prices as well. Cruise lines have also made vast efficiency savings in addition to cutting portion sizes and slimming down restaurant menus. Some cruise lines such as P&O have also got rid of some of the bespoke bar menus on their ships and created a universal menu across all bars on board and reduced the amount of beverages on offer. As an example, the Crow's Nest bar on P&O ships used to have a menu which was unique to that particular bar, with cocktails which could only be ordered and made there in the same way the bars on Cunard ships still operate. Bar menus with some cruise lines are definitely more limited, and this has a detrimental effect on service. A few years ago, it was never an issue to order a drink that wasn't on the menu. Speaking from experience, before the pause in cruise operations, I'd always be able to order a grasshopper cocktail, an 80s classic known by many bartenders on cruise ships, but rarely on a drinks menu. I never had an issue ordering that cocktail, but now beverage menus have been reduced, it now proves impossible, as they don't have the ingredients that they used to have. While service on cruise ships remains superior to most equivalent star-rated hotels, it feels as though you're not getting that personal, going the extra mile level of service which wowed me when I first started cruising in 2005. Efficiency savings are also pretty evident when it comes to cruise itineraries. This is due to a multitude of different reasons, including the increase in fuel prices and the war in Ukraine. Itineraries are now noticeably more fuel efficient, and cruise planners are reducing the amount of smaller and less visited ports to remedy any supply and bunkering issues which they could encounter and which have been occurring recently. Mini cruises are now more prevalent than they used to, and to give you another example, Western Mediterranean cruises departing from Southampton used to predominantly visit Italy, whereas now, many two-week Mediterranean cruises only go as far as the south of France, 
massively reducing a cruise company's fuel bills. It's not impossible to find a Mediterranean cruise that visits Italy, but they are certainly fewer and further between, and if you do find one, it's likely that the price will be pretty exorbitant. Because of everything that's happened over the last few years and the difficulties the world face ahead, you also need to be prepared that your cruise itinerary could change or be cancelled. In the last year, we've had three cruises cancelled and three out of nine of the cruises that we've done have had at least one port cancelled. Cruise lines will argue that they will always try and find an alternative port if that happens, but from our own experience in the last year, cruise lines are finding it more appealing to just substitute it with an extra sea day, which will certainly disappoint those that choose a cruise based more on the destinations it's visiting rather than the ship itself. Another aspect about cruising that we're really not keen on is having to book everything through apps. Ok, booking dinner is fair enough, but with some cruise lines you have to book virtually everything and it all seems a little pointless. Royal Caribbean, Cunard, p and and Princess now require you to book shows in the theatre and other venues on board through their app, and half the time the apps crash or time out and it just causes stress which you don't want on your holiday. Thankfully, we're pretty savvy with technology, but we've spoken to numerous cruisers older than us and they really hate the direction cruise lines are going in by putting so much emphasis on their apps etc. We're on holiday, allow people to turn up to entertainment on board by a first come first serve basis like it always has done and it's never presented an issue. Most theatres on cruise ships aren't even social distancing anymore, so what's the point in booking if it's not about numbers? The fact that we've already been on 9 cruises since cruising recommenced and that we have a further 10 in the pipeline shows that we still love to cruise, but it's important to go away and adjust your expectations so that you're not disappointed. As I've hopefully made clear in this video, most of the changes you'll notice are to do with the big sea, whether it's trying to keep passengers safe by means of safety measures and protocols, or by increasing prices and making cuts to address the debt they now face. We sympathise with the cruise lines, but it's also important that they're taking note of the scores and comments on passenger feedback cards so that they can identify the measures passengers aren't happy with, so that they can look at putting more effective policies in place which are less detrimental to a passenger's cruising experience. I do wonder whether cruising will ever be the same again, but one thing I am sure of is that it's still the best way to travel. Thanks for watching.